And l let me start you by uh, dropping the, the uh, other shoe, or maybe the fourth shoe. Why can't the presidential campaigns talk coherently, and why don't they talk at all, hardly, about the importance of the Supreme Court? The, it, it is obviously, one, you know, a crucial factor. You didn't even mention the, uh, the Voting Rights Act, which I think would be, you know, gravely threatened if, if, uh, if uh, Romney got the next appointment. But why can't the campaigns talk about it? Are the Republicans just embarrassed that this is such an activist conservative court? And is it too complicated for the Democrats to talk about coherently? I've asked that to top level political advisors of both parties. And the answer that I get is that most voters don't care about it. That it, there's certainly a core of Republican voters for whom this is an important issue, a core of solid Democratic voters from this question, but the candidates don't perceive that the swing voters are likely to be affected by the appeals with regard to the composition of the Supreme Court in the future. Now, it's up to voters to prove them wrong. It's up to the voters to show the candidates that they do care about this issue but the candidates perceive that the swing voters aren't gonna make up their mind on this issue, so they emphasize other issues. Now, of course, in this election, hearing the candidates talk about any issues rather than personality would be a huge improvement. Please. Could you talk something about these voter ID laws? They seem so related to uh, poll tax and uh, just seems like they're all unconstitutional but nobody else is saying that, thank you. Okay. In 2008, in a case called Crawford versus Marion County, Indiana, the Supreme Court found that a voter ID law was constitutional. Indiana had a law that required that individuals show photo ID in order to vote. If you didn't have a photo ID, then you could cast a provisional vote, but you'd have to go to the county seat with some form of identification within a certain number of days after voting in order for your ballot to be counted. And the Supreme Court in a six to three decision upheld that as constitutional. And you might even remember the case came down around March of 2008 and that the Indiana primary was in May of 2008 and the news showed a group of nuns being turned away from the polling place in Indiana because they didn't have photo ID. It's that Supreme Court decision, which is only four years old, which makes it hard to argue that voter ID is unconstitutional. Now, there is an argument that's being used in some states that the requirement for voter ID violates a federal statute, when it was just alluded to, the Voting Rights Act. And the reason why that argument is, I think, a strong one, notwithstanding the Supreme Court case, is you can't show that a law violates the Constitution just because it had a disproportionate effect on racial minorities. But you can show that a law violates the Voting Rights Act by showing it as a disproportionate effect on racial minorities. And so there's strong evidence that fo voter ID laws have a dis disproportionate effect on African American and Latino voters. And while that doesn't help in terms of a constitutional argument, it does work in terms of a Voting Rights Act argument. So that's the issue that's now being litigated, is the Voting Rights Act claim. And that's being litigated now in several courts. Um, but there's no doubt that the voter ID laws are very much politically motivated. When Indiana, the one that I mentioned, adopted it, every Republican in the state legislature voted in favor of it, and every Democrat voted against it, and the Republican governor signed it. So there's no doubt who's benefiting and who's hurting by these, but there is a disproportionate effect on minority voters, and it still has to be litigated under the Voting Rights Act. Uh, let me have a... you, uh, you may not know, you all may not know, that this morning a three-judge court uh, in Texas struck down the Texas photo ID law on the, on the grounds that it was, in essence, a poll tax. And by the way, we have a pair of uh, sunglasses here. Uh, could the owner please form a, a line over here uh, to... Might be mine. Uh, the last time uh, I had heard you talk, uh, we were discussing the uh, Citizens United decision, 
And you said that uh, the uh, constitutional amendment is not a good idea. Uh, yesterday, our president uh, got on Twitter, believe it or not, read it, and came out with a statement in favor of a constitutional amendment. Um, and he says, uh, over the longer term, I think we need to seriously consider mobilizing a constitutional amendment process to overturn Citizens United. Uh, and he says, with a qualifier, assuming the Supreme Court does revisit it. So I'm just curious to know whether uh, you still feel that strong that there should not be a constitutional amendment. I do, and it's a simple reason. I see no likelihood in the foreseeable future that a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United could possibly succeed. It takes two thirds of both houses of Congress and three quarters of the states to amend the Constitution. Is there really a plausible argument that you get two thirds of both houses of Congress bipartisan support to overrule Citizens United, let alone three quarters of the states? If not then, what I worry is all of the effort and energy that would go into a constitutional amendment could go into something else much more productive. What bothers me is there are things that Congress and the states could do to lessen the effect of Citizens United. There could be much stronger disclosure laws. In fact, after Citizens United, the House passed a bill, the Disclose Act. It wasn't a, even that great a disclosure law, but better than we have now. But the Senate filibustered it. The Republicans in the Senate blocked it. Um, states can adopt much stricter disclosure laws. This again goes to what we were talking about in terms of Knox versus SA. States could adopt laws saying corporations cannot spend money in political campaigns unless their shareholders in advance approve it. That's what the court in Knox says unions have to do. States can do that for corporations. That would tremendously lessen the effect of Citizens United. Why don't we, rather than a constitutional amendment, fight to get a law like that adopted? Or another example, as you may know, if somebody has a civil service job, they're not allowed to participate in partisan political activities. At the federal level, it's called the Hatch Act. Well, why not adopt a similar law that says that a corporation that does business with a government entity can't then spend money for those election campaigns? If the Hatch Act is constitutional, this would be constitutional. Well, my, it's not that I would disagree with the content of a constitutional amendment. It's just I'm pragmatic enough to think that all of the energy that would go to a constitutional amendment is going to mean we don't have the energy to do these kinds of things. And these are the things that could really happen that could make a difference. And if these things can't happen, then I'm even more convinced that a constitutional amendment couldn't happen. Well, the president had said he acknowledged these difficulties. Uh, but he argued that a push for an amendment would be a value in itself. Even if the amendment process falls short, it can shine a spotlight on the super PAC f phenomenon that helped apply pressure for change. So he, he's feeling that yeah. it actually would have a positive effect. I'm in favor of shedding light on the super PAC phenomena. I think there's many ways to do that. I'm not sure that a proposed constitutional amendment would really do that. And again, I, I say that with great respect for the president. I just think it's the wrong thing. The other thing I've got to admit, there's something to me very special, maybe even sacrosanct about the First Amendment. I'm not sure I like the idea of amending the First Amendment, even for what I think is a good result here, at least unless I can be convinced there's a way to accomplish it that wouldn't involve amending the First Amendment. Um, thank you so much for this and very, very informative. Oh, thank you. And congratulations on your incredible memory. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the importance of um, the lower federal courts uh, besides the Supreme Court. Um, and in light of that importance, I was really surprised and very disappointed to see a long article in the New York Times a couple weeks ago saying that um, President Obama's pace of appointing federal judges has been much, much slower than previous presidents. Um, and I'm wondering if you can shed any light on uh, why you think that is. What is it in the, the selection or vetting process? Why did he make that choice? And do you, if he were to be elected again, do you think he would speed up the pace? It's a great question. I think that several things were going on simultaneously. One is, I think during the first two years, they took the view 
everything was about getting health care adapted. And they decided not to push very hard on anything else, including judicial nominations. I think there was a certain amount of dysfunction in the White House Counsel's Office, which is who fills the lower federal court vacancies at the beginning. I think that's something that's been overcome. Also, and I have this from very high authority, they made the position for a while, especially during those first years, of only nominating people when they believed that they had 60 votes to get them through the Senate. And of course, the Republicans had no incentive in indicating whether they were going to filibuster or not. So especially during those first two years when there was a solid, at times even a full filibuster of Democratic majority, they weren't nominating people. During the last two years, the Democratic margin in the Senate has been much larger, and Republicans have filibustered many more of the Obama picks. The most notable of these is a University of California Berkeley law professor by the name of Goodwin Liu. And Goodwin Liu is just impeccably qualified. Um, and the Republicans just filibustered him. Uh, the real reason was because he testified against Samuel Alito and it was payback. Um, now Goodwin Liu is now on the California Supreme Court and he's going to be a great justice. But so I think if you put together a slow pace because of health care, a slow pace because of dysfunctional White House Counsel Office, a strange view with regard to what they had to line up in votes first, and Republican filibusters, that's what accounts for all of this. Um, I think what the next term will be is going to depend in part on what's the composition of the Senate. That if you have Republicans take over the Senate, even if Obama wins, it's going to be very hard to get a lot of nominees through. On the other hand, if the Democrats keep the Senate and they're willing to be aggressive, then I think President Obama can get picks through and I think he'll be, hopefully he'll be more aggressive. Thank you. Um, my question, there, there are two questions. Let's do them one I, at a time. Okay. The first one is DOMA. Okay. Um, sure. Do, do you think that there's a possibility that the change will happen through the judiciary or yes. through the Congress? Um, the question is about the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. The Defense of Marriage Act says that marriage for purpose of federal laws between a man and a woman. It also says that no state has to recognize a same-sex marriage from another state. I asked this question as a bankruptcy attorney who has handled bankruptcies for legally married sure. same-sex couples and they each had to file a separate bankruptcy because they were not legally recognized as married under the DOMA Act. This spring, May of 2012, the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, and that's the Federal Court of Appeals that covers Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Vermont, declared unconstitutional the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, specifically Section 3, that says for purpose that you're talking about marriage is between a man and a woman. Interestingly, Two of the three judges were Republican appointees, uh, Judge Michael Boudin, who wrote, and Judge Juan Torreya, who's in the majority, as well as a Democratic appointee, Sandra Lynch. Um, that case is now before the US Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has not yet decided whether to take it. There are several federal district courts around the country that have struck down this provision of the Defense of Marriage Act, and petitions for Supreme Court review are now pending in these cases, even though the federal courts of appeals haven't ruled. Now, there's also the case involving California's Proposition 8, Perry versus Brown. In February, the Ninth Circuit declared this unconstitutional. All of this is going to be for the Supreme Court to consider in late September. Here's my prediction. I think the Supreme Court at least is going to take the First Circuit DOMA case. And I think the Supreme Court is going to strike down DOMA. I think it's going to be five to four with Justice Kennedy writing joined by Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. And I have a simple basis for the prediction. I think for Anthony Kennedy, he has to face the question, does he want to write the next Plessy versus Ferguson or the next Brown versus Board of Education? There is no doubt where society is going on this issue. In the last decade, 12 countries around the world have changed their law to allow same-sex marriage. This includes predominantly Catholic countries like Spain and Portugal, it includes Mexico City. 
a number of states, in fact, more states each year through the political process are doing this. One of the statistics that I think is most important is that among individuals between the ages of 18 and 35, 70 percent believe that there should be marriage equality for gays and lesbians. Now, opinion polls show over 52 percent of the country believe that way. That's a dramatic change in a relatively short time. Justice Kennedy wants to be on the right side of history. He knows where history is going on this issue. There have been two Supreme Court cases in all of American history advancing rights for gays and lesbians. Romer v. Evans in 1996 and Lawrence v. Texas in 2003. Do you know who wrote the majority opinion in both of those cases advancing gay and lesbian rights? Anthony Kennedy. So that's why I make the prediction and I think with a pretty good certainty it's going to be five to four to strike down that provision of DOMA and I think what's going to happen in the spring of 2013. Okay, your other question. One other question and that is gun control. We, there was a marvelous article recently written that compared our gun laws to those of Israel, Japan, Russia, uh, Western Europe countries, European countries. And it seems to me that our laws and the Supreme Court keep holding that everybody can have a gun, everybody can have as many thousand clips, everybody can carry an automatic weapon that's designed to kill as many people as possible in the shortest amount of time. But if, if there's no change. <laughs> I just wrote a short article about this for the National Law Journal that's gonna come about a week. From 19, let me go back, in 1994, Congress passed and President Clinton signed a law that prohibited assault weapons, semi-automatics like AK-47s and things like that. These are weapons that serve no purpose but to kill a large number of human beings in a short amount of time. You can't use an AK-47 for hunting because it would obliterate whatever the animal is that's being hunted. They're not used for self-protection. We can argue about handguns separately. These are weapons of war. In 2004, this law expired and the Bush administration opposed its reenactment. In 2005, Congress passed a law that said that gun companies cannot be civilly sued for the harms that result from their products. When you look at what happened in Aurora, Colorado, where he went in with semi-automatic weapons that would have been prohibited under this statute. You think, why can't we use this as the impetus for saying that we need to prohibit these weapons? I mean, put aside, if he went in with a handgun, he could have killed maybe a few people before he was stopped. But with a semi-automatic weapon and 6,000 rounds of ammunition, we saw what the carnage was, or what happened last week at the Empire State Building, or what happened in Tucson, Arizona with Gabby Giffords. Um, there's just no justification in our society for having these kinds of weapons. There's no reason not to hold the companies that make them liable for the carnage they cause. And so I thought that, you know, the presidential candidates might agree that at least we can prohibit these kinds. Not even President Obama is willing to come out and say we should prohibit this. I mean, there seems to be such an assumption that gun rights are absolute. And I think we should put pressure on presidential candidates of both parties to say, whatever we believe otherwise about the Second Amendment, let's at least go back to what the law was before 2005 and prohibit assault weapons and hold the companies liable. I'd like to... Can you hear me? Can, yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. I want to ask about the political politicalization of pol politics in the Supreme Court. Um, do you not feel that one of the reasons this hasn't come up is because it's so obvious that it's become a political appointment? But as a nation, um, what can we do beyond drawing attention to this? Um, do we propose a shorter term of service? Uh, what do, you must sure. have some ideas on this. Sure, let me separate into two parts. 
One is in terms of the politicization of the Supreme Court, that's existed as long as there's been a Supreme Court. I'm teaching constitutional law to first year law students and I start with a case from 1803, Marbury versus Madison, which is political a decision as it could ever be from the Supreme Court. Um, in the late 19th, early 20th century, when the Supreme Court was striking down child labor laws and minimum wage laws, it was political. When the Supreme Court shifted course in the 1930s, it was political. Um, you know, Richard Nixon ran for president in 1968, attacking the Warren Court. I don't think that uh, politicization is something new about the Supreme Court. I don't think it'll ever be. On the other hand, I think this is a particularly poisonous time in terms of our political rhetoric, and it's not surprising that it carries over to the court. I would like to see changes, and maybe this is something I can talk about next year. Um, I'd like to see us go to term limits for Supreme Court justices. I'd like to see 18-year non-renewable terms. So every president, barring unexpected vacancies, would get to fill a seat on the Supreme Court every two years. You know, Jimmy Carter didn't get a single vacancy when he was president. Um, Richard Nixon got four in his first two years as president. Um, I think we should regularize it. I think lifespans have thankfully gotten longer. Um, justices are being appointed at a much younger age. I mean, both Elena Kagan and John Roberts were 50 years old when they went on the Supreme Court. It's conceivable they could be there for 40 some years. So I think a 18 year fixed term would allow somebody to master the job but not be there forever. Um, the other thing I'd like to see is much more of a true merit selection process for the Supreme Court. Let's create a panel as best we can make it of top lawyers, judges, academics, so everyone wanted to find it, and say to them, your job is without looking at politics and ideology, propose the best individuals you can for the court, and then amend the Constitution so the president has to pick from within that list. There are states that do this, and it works remarkably well in terms of something that I think is more merit selection than that. Some of the justice we have, I think, would have made it through any merit selection process. Elena Kagan, John Roberts, meet whatever definition of merit. There's others who I don't think would have made it through that process, and I think we'd have been better off with somebody else. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna let you off that easily in the okay. your answer to this. I wanna dig a little bit deeper. Uh, the two justices most vocal in the media about, uh, a justice, about Supreme Court justices not deciding cases on political grounds are Breyer on the one hand and Scalia on the other. And they both talk about the process of judging. And, and I think they're right in the sense that, they're, that, ju that uh, the justices are not deciding on ordinary political grounds, but it just so happens that their jurisprudential values happen to split the way you know they are. Could you, you make that sure. distinction? I think the word politics can be used in different ways. If what we mean is, is the Supreme Court deciding in response to the polls politically? No, I don't believe the Supreme Court reads the polls and decides how to vote. Is it that the justices are lobbied by people the way members of Congress or state legislature are lobbied? No, there is no lobbying of justices and no politics in that way. Do the justices trade votes in the way legislators might trade votes, saying, I'll vote for you on this one and you vote for me on that one? There's no evidence that ever in American history that's happened. So when they say it's not politics, well, no, it's not politics in that sense. But it is a situation where decisions are based on the ideology of the individuals. It's always been that way. And, you know, the Constitution is written in very broad language. It prohibits cruel, unusual punishment. It assures equal protection of the law. It requires due process. What do those things mean? Well, it's so much a function of what the justice believes. L let me give you a, an easy example. One of the questions was about the Second Amendment. Four years ago, the Supreme Court, for the first time in American history, held that the Second Amendment protects individuals to have guns in their own home. It's not limited to having guns for militia service. The majority was Scalia writing, joined by Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. The dissent was Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. 
Given that we're in a society right now where conservatives favor gun rights and liberals favor gun control, are we surprised that it's split five to four that way? Were any of us surprised in 2000 when Bush versus Gore was decided five to four with the five conservative justices on one side and the four on another? Do I believe they did that in terms of wanting a particular political outcome? No. Do I believe it was a function of the ideology they started with? Of course it is. Um, whenever you deal with the hotly contested issues, the justices' votes are a product of who they are and what they believe. It's inevitable in a human process. When I'm going to go argue a case in a federal court of appeals, the first question I get is, who's your panel? Who are your three judges? If a friend's arguing a case, it's always true. I remember arguing a, 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 tragic, a case with tragic facts, civil rights case, and finding out who my three judges were. And Mark Rosenbaum, the legal director of the ACLU, said to me, you should let your daughter, my daughter was then 12 years old, argue the case for you. She has as much chance as you do. I went before these judges and they were as hostile as could be and I called Mark on the phone on the way back and I said, I should have let my daughter Mara argue the case. She wouldn't have been as mean, they wouldn't have been as mean to her as they were to me and if they were, she could have gotten away with kicking them in their shins. <laughs> it's all about, uh, judging isn't scientific, it's a product of who the judges are, their life experience and their values. Last question and then I'm gonna have to leave. About, uh, Ruth, Bader Grin about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, are you aware of any movement to uh, entice her to resign so that uh, President Obama could replace her before the uncertainties of the oncoming election? It's too late. If she were to resign now, there is no way that President Obama could get somebody through the Senate. Um, this goes back to 1968, a piece of American history that is misremembered. Earl Warren announced his resignation and President Johnson nominated Abe Fortas to replace him as Chief Justice and nominated a federal court of appeals judge who was a crony of LBJ's, Homer Thornbury, to take his position. Senator Strom Thurmond led a successful filibuster saying a lame duck president shouldn't be able to fill judicial vacancies. Subsequent to that, by several months, the improprieties by Abe Fortas were revealed and caused him to resign from the bench. But people tend to forget that the blocking of the vacancies wasn't because of the improprieties. Um, there is no doubt the Republicans would not allow President Obama to fill a vacancy now. And in all fairness, had George W. Bush had a vacancy to fill in August of 2008, the Democrats wouldn't have let him fill it. Now there was a lot of talk on the blogs last year about whether Justice Ginsburg should have resigned a year ago and let President Obama fill the vacancy. Um, and that's so hard. I mean, you know, I can understand why she didn't want to give up the position. I understand those who say she should have. And of course, if President Obama loses in November, then the wish that only he could have filled the vacancy would be all the stronger. Let me do this as the last question, then I'm going to run. I don't have a question for you, but on behalf of this wonderful, fabulous turnout, and for Orange County, who desperately needs you. You're very sweet. Thank you for Thank coming. You. That's so sweet of you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you. That's so kind of you. Thank you. Thank you for your brilliance. Uh, and thank you for your humanity. Thank you. I do, I talked to her recently in the petition she started. Yeah. <laughs>